Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. Through God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. The word of God that we consider this morning as the basis for our message, our gospel reading found in John's Gospel, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse. We bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, there are so many different barriers that are placed in our way that distract us, that discourage us from approaching your throne in prayer. This morning as we consider our gospel reading, we pray that those barriers will be destroyed, that we'll find every motivation in the world to come before you with large and small petitions, with all of our worries and concerns, and take advantage of the wonderful privilege and blessing that it is to come to you and speak to you. That is our prayer this morning, in your Son's most holy name. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, in a lot of the different activities that we simply undertake over the course of our lives, there's often a carrot at the end of the stick, right? So there's always a motivation for just about everything that we do. Think about back when some of us were in school. Why did we study hard, or maybe why should we have studied hard? Well, maybe to get into a good college, get into a good trade school, to have a good GPA so we could have better recommendations or things like that. We exercise and we eat right, or hopefully we do, so that we'll have a longer life, we'll be healthier, and ultimately be happier. Why do we work hard at our jobs? Well, so we can promote ourselves within those jobs. We can keep a roof over our head. We can keep food on the table, take care of ourselves and others. And just about everything that we do, there's always that carrot, that motivation that's at the end of the stick that provides us with an impetus for doing something. And that's just as true with prayer as it is with anything else. Whether or not it should be the case or not, it's a different story. But nevertheless, there is a carrot at the end of the stick when it comes to prayer. And that's focusing on the promise that Christ has given to you and me, that all of our prayers are heard, that God answers all of our prayers, and that we have the right, we have the privilege, we have the ability to go directly to God, to boldly approach His throne with any concern, any worry, any care, any petition, big or small, whether we perceive them to be selfish or not. God has given you and me the right and the ability to approach Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the promise that Jesus gives to you and me this morning through his word. And so our prayer this morning is that as we think about this promise, as we think about prayer in our lives, that we will focus on this promise, that God will use it to bulldoze any barriers in our lives that keep us from the throne of God, and that we will be properly motivated to always go before our Lord in prayer. Have you ever thought about what a wonderful privilege it is to pray. If you're going to talk to somebody who's not a Christian, not religious, and they ask you, what is prayer? There's that stand pat answer that, well, it's my ability to talk with God. And there's something profound in that phrase, talk with God, that just sometimes gets almost hidden by the simplicity of that definition. That you and I get to talk with God, that we get to talk with the most powerful being that there is in the entire universe. That we get to go directly and talk with our Father in heaven. And that's not something that we have by nature the same way that you and I can talk with our parents or used to be able to talk with our parents or our best friend. It's a privilege and ability that has been won for us through the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross and that veil in the temple was torn in two, what was being symbolized by that fact was now there was nothing that stood between me, between you, and our Father in heaven. That we didn't have to go through priests, we didn't have to go through special people, we didn't have to be worthy enough to approach our Father in prayer because Christ had made us worthy. And he had already divided that temple so that now nothing stands between you, me, and our Father in heaven. And what an incredible thing that is. Because if you are going to take a long drive or a plane flight over to Washington, D.C., knock on the front door of the White House and try to give the president all of your solutions to the world's problems, that probably wouldn't work out all that well. Secret Service would be after you very, very quick. And even if you did it the proper way, try to set up an appointment, and good luck with that particular thing. 
if you're going to drive 25 minutes up the road and go to the state capitol and talk with Governor Cox about all the different things you think that the state of Utah should be doing right now, or might be able to do, you're not going to be able to do that. You just can't knock on the door saying, hey, Gov, can we talk for a little bit? And even back in December, I had the privilege to meet with the mayor of West Jordan. And even a city the size of West Jordan, I didn't just simply go to City Hall and say, hey, Mr. Mayor, can we chat? I couldn't even directly email him. My request had to be funneled through his secretary. And so there's always this indirect communication that we have with people to set up those appointments to have that sort of contact. But that's not something that we have to do with God. We don't take a look at our planners and then take a look at his planner and see when might be a good time for us to chat. He doesn't come to us and say, well, what have you done for me lately? Have you given me enough money? Have you done enough good actions and maybe I can squeeze you in? No, God tells us, come to me. Come before my throne and pray. Let's chat whenever you want about whatever you want. You have direct access without negotiation, without any degree of trying to worry about worthiness to our Father in heaven. Just ponder that fact that you and I can talk with God and how awesome that privilege is. And on top of all that, we have direct access to God, but then the person to whom we are chatting with in prayer does not have selective hearing like so many of us do. God promises that he's not going to hear just some of our prayers, some of our petitions, but rather he's going to hear each and every one. Psalm 102, verse 17, God regards the prayers of the destitute and does not despise their prayers. So God's no respecter of persons. It doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, whether you come from the right family, whether you've been a Christian for 90 years or five minutes or any of those sorts of things. God doesn't care about what personal hardships might be coming between you and him because he gives you that invitation. He says, come. And on top of that, then he promises to hear you no matter what. That's the blessing that Jesus died to give us, and that's the mercy that God has towards us. And then to prove that his promise to hear our prayers is not just a whole bunch of hot air, then God gives us in his word example after example after example of all the different times that he heard the prayers of his people. And he answered them. When the ancient Hebrews were enslaved in Egypt, God heard their groaning, Moses writes. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, my favorite phrase in all of this, and God knew. And so God eventually sent his prophet Moses to allow the people to be liberated from slavery, to let his people go, and then go on to the promised land. In 1 Samuel, barren Hannah desired a child more than anything else. And she prayed that she would be blessed with the child. And then the author of 1 Samuel says that the Lord heard her prayers and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel. One more example, in 2 Kings chapter 20, King Hezekiah was sick to the point of death. And then he prayed that his life might be extended, that he might be healed. And the Lord heard his prayers and he was healed and his life was extended for another 15 years. So scripture's testimony is clear that God hears the prayers of his people. And if God hears the prayers of the people of Israel, if he hears Hannah's prayers, if he hears Hezekiah's prayers, that also means that he hears your prayer and my prayer. So he hears prayers, he answers prayers, he gives a certain and sure promise that he will do both of those things always. It's a wonderful privilege, so wonderful that in fact he sent his son to die to destroy that veil that separates us from God. So then the question then becomes, why is prayer such a challenge for so many of us? I know so many Christians who can pat themselves on the back because they know the kings of Israel backwards and forwards. They have fantastic Bible knowledge. They are very generous. They are charitable. They have love that emulates that Christ. Praise God for that. I have yet to meet a single Christian who says that their prayer life is spectacular and wonderful and fully in order. I have yet to meet a Christian who can brag truthfully or otherwise about their relationship, their ability to chat with God. Many of us will admit privately, if nothing else, that it can be very difficult for us to sit down, to stand up, to, to bow our knee or whatever, to pray to God. For some of us, prayer doesn't just roll off of our tongues the same way that a conversation does with our nearest and our dearest. 
And if I were going to grab a whiteboard and then just kind of come up with all different reasons, allow you to say, here are all different reasons why prayer can be challenging, we come up with a whole bunch of different examples, some of them overlapping, but I imagine a lot of them would be unique to our own personal situations. There, of course, is the stand pat answer of laziness and slothfulness, the idea that I can find time for anything and everything under the sun. I can spend three hours on a fall Sunday afternoon watching football, but then there's those five minutes of prayer at the end of my day that somehow I just can't seem to find. I can play cards, I can read a book, I can watch TV, I can go on vacation, I can talk with my best friend for two hours every Sunday evening. And yet trying to squeeze in a few moments of prayer with my Heavenly Father, my gosh, that can be difficult. There's an element of laziness and sloth when it comes to that because am I truly budgeting my time properly? Am I also motivated to do that? There's slothfulness, there's laziness. There's also the simple fact that sometimes prayer can seem rote, that it can be boring, that there's not lightning bolts coming from heaven every time I pray. I don't always feel that warm burning within my bosom when I bend down and bow down and kneel and pray to my Heavenly Father. We seem to get nothing out of it. It has the same interest level as talking with a brick wall because nobody seems to be talking much back. And so I pray, and I pray for a little bit, but nothing really seems to happen. My relationship with God doesn't seem to be any closer, and so, eh, I quit. And that's more of a reflection upon me than it is upon God, because that's telling me something about my own relationship with God and the practical atheism that lurks within my soul, that unbelief, that says, well, if talking to God is like talking to a brick wall, do I really believe that God exists? Do I really sense his presence in my life? Probably not. And so my struggle with prayer can be some form of latent unbelief, latent atheism that lurks within my soul. So there's laziness, there's practical atheism, but then there's also the fact that some of us might be scared to pray. How many of us, when we know that we have fallen short of the glory of God, when we know that we have violated God's commandments, when we know that we need his forgiveness and mercy, for most of us, our first impulse is not immediately to bow down before the Lord, confess our sins, and beg for his forgiveness and mercy. We try to pull an Adam and Eve and hide away from God as fast as, as much as possible because we are ashamed of our sins. And we are scared that after sin, if we come before God's throne in prayer, that he's going to zap us, he's going to kill us, that he's going to punish us in some form or another, that he's going to go all Old Testament on us. We're scared that if we confess our sins to him, there's not going to be mercy and forgiveness coming back our way. And part of that then and hidden within that is this sense of worthiness, that in order for me to come before God's throne in prayer, that I need to be worthy to come before him, worthy to receive his mercy, worthy for him then to answer my prayer for forgiveness. And my sense of shame, my sense of unworthiness, my, sense, my lack of God's, sense of God's mercy bleeds out of that. Maybe there's that sense too where he might go after us like a frustrated parent. You did what again? You screwed up again? Didn't we have this conversation a week ago, and yet here we are back at the throne of God, begging for forgiveness for the exact same sin? Maybe our sin has caused us to exceed the warranty of the cross. Even as believing Christians, we have issues praying, praying regularly, praying fervently, praying expecting blessing, praying expecting the blessing of forgiveness that God has given to us in the cross. And we forget the privilege that he has given us by allowing him without appointment, without concern of words, without any of those things, to come before him in prayer. And so what then is the carrot at the end of the stick? What then becomes our motivation to fight through our sinful nature, to fight through our boredom, to fight through our laziness, to fight through our concerns that God is not going to be faithful to us? What we find in our text this morning, we find it in the promise that Christ gives to the believers 2,000 years ago, but it's just as valid for you and me as it was for all of them those millennia ago. Verses 23 and 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. So here, Christ reiterates the promise of Scripture to you, that 
no matter what, because of what Christ has done for us, God will hear our prayers. He's going to grant our petitions according to his will. And that's what Christ teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what Jesus also prayed himself when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was facing the cross and what all that meant. He said, Father, remove this cup from me if it be your will, but not my will, but thy will, but your will be done. Jesus promises you and me that if we ask, God, according to verse 24, will give it to you so that your joy may be full. What a wonderful promise that is on top of the privilege of prayer. And we need to be careful about this promise because when we hear joy, our minds automatically go in very certain directions. That if I pray, then God's going to make me happy and blessed according to my standards and according to my will and desires right here and right now. That I want joy here, not necessarily joy later. But the cool thing about God, one of the many cool things about God is that he has the perfect eternal perspective. He knows every element of our life, every second, everything that we need, far better than what you and I ever could. He knows what ultimately will bring us joy, not only joy here and now, but also joy in the eternal sense. And so God promises that when you pray, no matter if you're in a moment of light or a moment of darkness, if you're having happiness right now or the opposite of happiness right now, God will give according to your will His purpose for your joy here and hereafter. God knows everything about us, and so therefore we come to him with the joy knowing and the trust knowing that God works for the good of all those who believe in him. And so we trust in God, in his goodness, in his love, in his mercy. We trust in the God who loved us so much that he sent his son to die for us, who knows us much better than what we know ourselves, and that motivates us. Our knowledge of God, who he is, and his undying, unnegotiable love for us motivates us to come before him with problems big and small, with our anxieties, with our worries, with our concerns, with our thanksgivings, and with our petitions. We leave them before his throne boldly, and then we pray, thy will, not my will, be done. And then we walk away from that prayer knowing that no matter what happens, whether God answers that prayer with yes, no, or maybe so, that our joy will be full through God's love for us. So brothers and sisters, whenever we get bored, whenever we get concerned, our prayers won't be heard. Whenever we have challenges that somehow keep us from the Lord in prayer, come back to this promise. God answers prayer always. And when God answers prayer, he always does it with your eternal joy in mind. That's what Jesus promises us in verses 26 and 27. I will ask you in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved him, and have believed that I came from God. You have access to God. You have access to God in prayer. You have access to the cross. Therefore, God gives you access to eternal joy through prayer. In Christ's most holy name, amen. And please receive your Lord's blessing. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep and guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue by singing our offertory hymn, Create in me a clean heart, O God, found in our bulletin. I invite you to please stand as you are able.